you the tools are going to be the same whether we're doing troubleshooting for a problem or troubleshooting for performance. Basically what we're trying to do is answer a few questions and the most obvious is why doesn't this work? Or how can I make this better? And we're talking about performance. So that's really what we're looking at when we're talking about this are these two basic questions we're going to deal with. So the first question we need to ask is what is troubleshooting? What are we talking about when we say troubleshooting? A very com and also why does it seem difficult? Uh, we all troubleshoot. We all troubleshoot every day. The fact that people are sitting here today you all can do troubleshooting. You found Boston, which is a pretty big target. You found the hotel, and you found this room. So you did troubleshooting. It seems pretty basic, but basic problem solving everybody does. But why does it seem so difficult at times, particularly with some of the things we're dealing with with complex systems? We're going to take a look at a troubleshooting process. It's just one of many, and we'll talk a little bit about it. We're going to look at some of the tools that are in Alpha Anywhere to help you do troubleshooting and get information. So let's start out. What is the definition of troubleshooting? And this is one I've seen a number of places. It seems very simple, but says a lot. A systematic method to solve problems. If you think about this, what's our goal? Solve problems. But the key word in this little sentence is systematic. A good troubleshooting process is a very defined process. It's very systematic. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a forensic process. And if we look at the term of what a forensic process is, a scientific method of gathering and examining information. That's troubleshooting. It's a scientific method. There is a process behind this that is very well defined. So why does troubleshooting seem so difficult? There's a lot of reasons. And one of them is knowledge deficiencies. None of us are experts on everything, although I've met a few people in life who believe they are. But for the most part, we're not experts on everything. So there's going to be knowledge deficiencies. We're going to have knowledge gaps. Uh, there's going to be things we don't, aren't that good on. So they're going to cause us problems. The biggest one, though, is what we refer to as a haphazard approach. This is a situation where people go about troubleshooting with no plan, uh, no process, nothing. They just try to hope they find the problem. Another reason where troubleshooting can be difficult is focusing on only one part of a problem. We tend to get tunnel vision. Uh, we see this a lot where people put the blinders on and they only look in one area. Which underneath that falls into something called preconceived ideas. Uh, this is a killer in troubleshooting. When you go into troubleshooting and you have ideas, you think you know what it is, uh, you put those blinders on and inevitably the problem is outside the blinders. Another thing that uh, troubleshooters tend to run into trouble with is sticking to known strategies and methods and tools. You know, you, you learn how to use a tool, you learn a strategy, and that's the only one you use. It doesn't apply in every case. It may work fantastic in one type of problem and terribly in another. So the more strategies you have, the more tools you have, the better you're going to do. Now, a lot of this information has actually been derived from studies done on troubleshooting. Obviously, in a lot of industries, troubleshooting is really kind of important. When you're talking aircraft companies or NASA or somebody like that, troubleshooting is very, very important. And they've done a lot of studies. And these are the things that they have found. Uh, this one never comes into play, does it? <laughs> you know, the customer calls you on the phone, my system's down, I've got to be back up in 20 minutes or it's going to cost you X amount of dollars. But this can cause you problems. When you start allowing motion to get into your process, you're going to stop thinking. You're going to start dealing with your emotions rather than thinking about solutions. Hard to do, but you got to do it. Also, t people tend to overestimate their skills. They can't accept that everybody makes mistakes. Anybody see a mistake here? <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> everybody makes mistakes. Yeah. A lot of people don't want to learn how to troubleshoot. They really don't want to learn that process. It's hard. It can be difficult. It can be tedious. So people don't want to learn it. They want to let somebody else deal with it. However, I will make one statement. Anyone can learn how to troubleshoot. I mean, I've taught people to troubleshoot that had a little challenge tying their shoes, and yet they turned out to be decent troubleshooters. Another one is people want an answer. They don't want a method to find the answer. This is very common. People see a problem and say, I want to know what's wrong. No, you want to know how to find out what's wrong. If somebody tells you what's wrong, what's going to happen the next time you have that problem? You've learned nothing. 
And it's also very easy to blame other people. Easy targets. Not my problem. Somebody else's problem. Uh, we've never had that happen, right? <clears throat> of course not. Let's take a look at a troubleshooting process. Now, what I'm going to show here is kind of a uh, generic process that's been developed for a variety of other ones. There's things like the scientific method that many of us have heard about. It follows the same basic process. And this is just one way it's been broken down. All troubleshooting, no matter how you break it down, is going to have many of these elements in it in roughly the same order. First thing you have to do is define the problem. It seems obvious, yet it's missed a lot. Get organized. We'll talk about what this means in a second. Confirm the problem exists. Uh, has anyone in, there, in here ever wasted a day or so chasing a phantom? <laughs> there is no problem. Confirm there is a problem before you start spending a lot of time. Yeah. Gather information. You're going to see an interesting twist here. Then analyze or isolate and eliminate. Typically when we're analyzing data, what we're doing is something called uh, isolate and eliminate. You're trying to isolate problems and you're trying to eliminate things that cannot be. And as you break that down, you start getting into a closer to the target. And what we're looking for is something called root cause. Uh, one presentation yesterday with Scott mentioned root cause in his presentation. It's a term that very, has a very strict definition. And we're looking for the root cause, which is very important. And then once you find the cause, fix it. But are we done at the end to fix it? Absolutely not. Test the fix. Make sure you actually fixed it. Like I say, this is a process that has been developed from a lot of research. Uh, there's a lot of variations of this. But if you look at them, they'll all have similar sequence. Let's talk about defining the problem. This is sometimes referred to as putting a fence around the problem. It's very easy to get overwhelmed when you have a massive system or something. You're trying to put a fence around it. You're trying to limit what you're looking at. You're basically answering a couple <coughs> questions. What happened? When did it happen? And what is known about how it happened? So you're looking for a what, a when, and a how. Do not put an analysis in your problem statement. If there's a because in your problem statement, it's no longer a problem statement. You're already, you're already coming with a preconceived idea because you have a because. So the problem statement should just state the obvious. You go to the doctor, what do they ask for? Your symptoms. They don't ask you what disease you have. At least a good doctor. It's not, it's broke, it doesn't work, or why did I get this error? Those are not problem statements. Uh, I'm sure if you've worked with clients, you get that, the call, it's broke. Well, that's nice, but it doesn't help me. Yes. Hmm? Nothing happens. Nothing happens, yeah. Well, that's a problem statement, because you're describing what doesn't happen. Get organized. A lot of people don't understand what this is about, but the very first thing is backup. Back up your system. Make sure you have a rollback option, because in the process of doing troubleshooting, it's very likely you're going to make changes that are successful, some that are unsuccessful, and you're very likely to change the initial conditions. When you're all done, you want to go back and verify that you fixed the original conditions. So make sure you can roll back. How many people in here have been burned by not doing a backup? I'll put mine up. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't test on a production system. Again, this was brought up uh, by one of the presenters. You know, test on a test system, something you can break. Because inevitably, you're going to break it while you're doing this. Don't test on production. I do know developers that will make a change, fire it out to production, and you know, then they, they pray that they got it right. Not the way to do it. Keep notes. Keep notes of all the steps you took and, and records of the results. If you do a test, write down the result. Don't try to remember it because guaranteed you're going to forget the most critical fact. Have a plan. It's really important when you start out here, you just don't go at it. Take a moment, develop a plan of how you want to attack this problem. And finally, relax. Put the emotion away. If you let the emotion rule, you're going to stop thinking. And this is a thinking process. Troubleshooting is a mental process. Have you ever seen a good troubleshooter sit and stare at a problem and do nothing? What they're doing is they're trying to solve it in their head. They're running scenarios. They're doing things in their head. They're not actually doing anything visibly. They're relaxing and trying to get focused. Confirm the problem exists. Duplicate it. Make sure it really exists. If you can duplicate it, create a step-by-step -step process. If you look at our bug reports, that's one of the things that's listed specifically in our bug report. 
give us a step-by-step -step process. And if the first step is start alpha anywhere, that's okay. Because that means alpha anywhere isn't running when you start your test. It's actually a piece of information. It could be useful. <coughs> if possible, create a small sample case. The problem with this is you may make a sample case that's too small and the problem's not in their sample. If you make a sample, make sure it is exhibiting the exact same problem that you're looking for. What happens if you can't duplicate it? And this does occur. It could be intermittent. It could be something that comes and goes based on conditions that you don't know about at this point. This does happen quite a bit. You may have a poor problem definition. The problem may be outside that fence. You put a fence around the problem, but it was too small. The problem was actually outside there. Or there may be multiple contributors. This does happen in complex systems, which sometimes makes it difficult to, to duplicate because all those contributors have to be present for you to do the duplication. And if you don't have them all, it's not going to work. Gather information. What's the operating environment? Like operating system, et cetera, et cetera. What are you dealing with? What does work? This is actually much more critical than people realize because the things that do work are some things we can set aside at some point not necessarily in the beginning, but may sit set aside. We know those are okay at this point. Were there other problems that occurred at the same time? Has anything changed recently? We always hear the thing, well, I put a new patch in and X happened. What else changed? Oh, at the same time I created a new component or, or edited the component or uh, I got a Windows update or you know, my three-year-old was playing on the computer punching keys. You know, anything that changed. Don't narrow your focus with that preconceived idea. Has it happened before? It's helpful. It may not be the same, but it's helpful to know this. Are there any error messages? An error message is just a piece of information. It is not a solution. It's just a piece of information. But it's helpful. How often does this occur? Every time, every other time. Uh, there was a problem recently we were dealing with that happened about every third time when you went through a certain operation which was kind of useful because it led us down a path that we were able to solve the problem. And on and on. There's lots of data we can gather. When you're gathering information, all you're looking for is to make sure it is accurate. That's your goal. When you gather information, is it accurate? What it isn't is to determine if it's related to the cause. You're just gathering information. When a police officer does a forensic examination of a crime, they don't know what's pertinent and what isn't. They just get everything. Same thing you should be doing when you're doing your troubleshooting. Even if it doesn't seem like it pertains, if it's available to you, make a note of it. And you'll see this come up a few times in this presentation. Avoid the preconceived ideas. What happens very often in a troubleshooting process, someone will get started. They start out with good intentions, a good plan. <laughs> they get partway in and say, oh, that's what it is, and off they go. They don't complete the process. And usually what happens then, they start over. You ever hear the term thinking out of the box? I always like that term because all it means is you're not working with preconceived ideas. You're letting, you're letting the, your thought process be very broad. You're not limiting it. So I always think that thinking out of the box is why would you want to think in the box? Analyze the data. This is what we call isolate and eliminate. Is the data related to the problem area? That's important. Notice we just gathered data. Now we're going to do something with it. Is it related? Is the data accurate? Hopefully we verified that. We may want to do it again. Then how do we eliminate and isolate? There's a lot of tactics involved. We'll look at a couple of them in here that are very interesting. One of the most interesting ones and one of the most effective is something called halving. It has some other terms sometimes called block analysis. But uh, basically what it is, you, if you have code or data, you split it in half. Is the problem in one half or the other half? Once you check, find out which half it's in, you split that in half and you keep going. A great way this is demonstrated is with a deck of cards. Have someone pull a card out of the deck and say, a standard deck of cards, and say, I can guess what card you have in seven questions or less. If you're lucky, you can do it in six, but sometimes it takes seven. What's the first question you ask? Is it a red card? <coughs> if they say no, you've now eliminated half the deck. Is it a spade? No, you're now down to 13 of 52 cards. You've now cut it into a quarter in two questions. That's the, the advantage of having. If you break it down into big blocks, into smaller blocks, and smaller blocks, you can narrow in on the problem very, very quickly. It's an extremely effective way of doing troubleshooting. 
It's very fast when you can apply it. There's some situations where it doesn't work, but usually good troubleshooters will start with this type of technique. The problem is it may fail with multiple contributors. Uh, I ran into a situation with some corrupted data a, on a system, tested it with half the data, had the problem. Tested the other half of the data, still had the problem. So then I tested with a third set of data kind of out of the middle, problem went away. So now I knew it was a data problem, I just didn't know where it was. Turned out there were two corrupted records. Which is a little more, still the same technique could be used. They just kept bigger and bigger blocks until the problem came back, then started shrinking it down and said, what did I take off that block? Bad data was there. Another way of doing it is what's called pattern recognition, looking for common patterns, you know, such as X always causes Y. There are patterns that develop in complex systems. You know, if you do something wrong, you're going to see a certain result. The problem is this may re require a lot of experience and a lot of system knowledge. If you don't know how the system works, you don't understand uh, case sensitivity in JavaScript, for example, if you don't know that, you're not going to see that pattern because you don't know it's there. It's typically only used by experts in the system they're working in uh, because, because they know what patterns they should see. They know what is correct, therefore they can see what is wrong. It's like when I put that word up, mistakes. Almost everybody caught it. It's a pattern. You saw a pattern that looked wrong. I know people that can look at spelling and tell you every misspelled word in, in the, in the dic that they're seeing in a document, but ask them to spell it correctly and they can't spell any of them. They know the pattern, they don't know the solution. It's very easy to see the wrong pattern if you're not as expert as you may think you are. You'll see something, it's got to be that, I see this pattern. It may not be. Another one that's commonly used is called probabilities. This is where we have based on past history. You know, systems develop a history over time, what things most likely fail, what at least likely fail. Common errors, things that happen a lot, how often they occur, the more often an error occurs, the easier it is to develop that history. And it's most effective if you have an extensive history on the system. It's used a lot in hardware troubleshooting. Um, I don't know how many people have had issues with hardware, but the first thing they do when they go through a, a certain process, uh, I had a problem with a computer one time, and the first thing the guy told me was a test on the video card. Now, why did he ask me for a test on the video card? Because that particular machine had a long history of bad video cards. And sure enough, that's what it was, bad video card. But unless you don't have, if you don't have that history, this isn't going to get you very far. You'll see a lot of things called troubleshooting trees, uh, flow charts, uh, fixed test procedures. Uh, these are usually developed because of the patterns and because of probabilities. The problem with these, it only works if the problem fits an expected or previously seen pattern. If it's something fairly new or it's a combination of factors that hasn't been put together before, uh, these troubleshooting trees and flow charts will probably frustrate you. I almost never use a flow chart or troubleshooting tree. Uh, there's some systems I know about outside of the computer world that have, that I know what problems there are, I know how they go. I look at the flow charts to get you there and I just laugh at them because, you know, the first thing you do when you call the hardware problem, I have voice over IP and the first thing they tell you to do is, well, reboot the modem, reboot the adapter, reboot the phone. It's like, dude, I've done that six times already. And then what are they asking? So, okay, can you reboot the modem? You know, they go through their little tree. It's like, you know, if they did a troubleshooting process, they know that first half of the tree was wasted time. But they didn't. Another common technique that is effective is what's called linear. And basically, it's line by line analysis. You're going through the code or data one at a time. It is effective, sometimes referred to as walking the code. You may hear that term from time to time. You're walking it line by line to see what happens. It's also sometimes called exhaustive search, primarily because by the time you're done, you're exhausted. It's very tedious. It is methodical, but it is tedious. This should not be your first choice if you can avoid it. The problem with, with the linear analysis, and there's some related to it called spatial, which is kind of the same thing, um, you may not reach all conditions because in a lot of the stuff we work with, there's conditional effects. You know, if x equals this, you go here. If x equals that, you go there. Well, when you're doing a linear analysis, you may not hit the era, area that has the problem. We're actually going to show you an example of that. Typically, the linear should be a last resort. It shouldn't be your first choice. And yet, I see a lot of troubleshooters, what's their first choice? Go line by line, 
thousand lines later, oh, that's where I forgot the question mark or I forgot the parentheses. Uh, and they just spent an hour looking for something simple. There's another technique called what if. <clears throat> if I change something, what will happen? Uh, this is actually a fairly good troubleshooting technique, but it does require a lot of system knowledge. You have to have an, an understanding of what should happen if I change this. If I change a certain value, what should the system do? So you have to understand what the system's all about. It sometimes is used to recreate a problem that's difficult to repeat. We have an intermittent problem. We can change a condition, uh, change a factor, and see what happens. If the system's behaving the way it should behave, we should see a predictable result. So what if is pretty good, but it does require a lot of experience and knowledge. And typically, this is only used when all the other methods are inconclusive or they're difficult to do. Again, not a first choice, although it is for some people. Uh, there's other methods, what we call the shotgun method. Anybody guess what that is? Try anything. We don't care if it makes any sense or not. We try it anyway. Oddly enough, this is probably the, the troubleshooting process of choice by an awful lot of troubleshooters. They start trying things. Ever go into our message board and see somebody post a problem and you see all these bizarre answers underneath it? These are people using the shotgun approach. They don't have any information. They're just guessing. Which brings up the next one, which I won't uh, break down, but it's scientific wild guess. This is actually a little better than the shotgun because it's scientific, but it's still a guess. This is kind of a, an ex extension of what if. Any analysis technique you do is trying to do one thing. Eliminate what it can't be to find out what it can be. And there's a famous quote on, whoops, let me back up here. Decide to leave. There you go. Quote uh, attributed to Sherlock Holmes, which is Arthur Conan Doyle. Once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. That's what troubleshooting is. You're looking for the truth. So you're eliminating what it can't be. Root cause, what do we mean by root cause? The root cause is what started the process. Word started is important. Why did it happen? We need to know why this particular root cause existed. There may be multiple factors and a lot of complex failures uh, like accidents and things like that, there's typically more than one root cause. You, know, you take the, the causes, it may be three or four, you take one away and the accident doesn't occur. But still, you have to identify those root causes. And very often, there's one major contributor. When you think you've found the root cause, ask yourself a question. Is this a cause or is it an effect? For example, if the root cause you found is a syntax error in uh, SQL Server, what's the root cause? The syntax error or the developer's lack of knowledge? The developer may not know that was an error. So the root cause is actually their, the education, not the fact that they made the error. So you correct the education, they probably won't make that error again. What they're trying to do is you find the root cause, you're trying to prevent making the same mistake twice. If you fix a result, but you don't fix the cause, the cause is still around, it's going to happen again. And you're going to go through the same process over and over again until you actually dig deep enough to find the root cause. Fix it. This should be the easy part. Should be. Typically, if you have found the problem, you can usually fix it. If you can get to the point where you know exactly what it is, you can typically fix it. But if you can't fix it, one thing to remember, if you've done a good troubleshooting process up to this point, and you did something I said in the beginning, document it, write it all down, you can give your analysis to that point to someone else who has the ability to go a little deeper, and maybe they can continue the process and find a solution. If somebody comes to you with that kind of information, what's your first step? Start at the very beginning and retrace their steps. Make sure they didn't make a mistake. Don't just assume that they're right. Test the fix. This is one that's often forgotten, particularly when that little thing called emotion comes up. We're under a deadline, we've got to get it out. We're going to publish this thing. We're going to take a chance. Don't. Verify you fixed the problems that were in the problem definition. If this is a complex problem, you're some distance from that definition. That's why you write it down. Did you fix the problems that you started to find? Or did you go off somewhere? Go over it step by step to repeat the original problem. Remember we said backup? Once you've found all the solution, 
a good troubleshooter will go back to the very beginning, start from the beginning, do a restore to where they were, that same starting point, apply the fix, see if it's actually fixed. Because they may have done something in the middle that changed the whole condition. Is the problem corrected? That's an obvious question. But this one uh, never happens, right? Nobody ever fixes a bug and finds there's now three more. <laughs> we all do that. Uh, so check if there's any new problems. It does happen. Can all problems be solved? This question comes up periodically. Theoretically, if you can duplicate it, you can find it. And if you can find it, you can fix it, theoretically. But in reality, you may not have all the tools you need or the knowledge to find or solve every problem. Um, a little note on the side, we ran into a problem, a bug report that came in. We could verify it. We was definitely doing it. We couldn't find enough information. We actually had to build the tool in the program to go get data to solve the problem because we didn't have a tool that could give us the piece of data that we needed. We knew what we needed, we just couldn't verify it. So we actually had to build a tool to get the data. Then we could solve it. And you may find the problem but not have the tools to fix it. So in that case, you're probably going to get, get some help. You may need outside help. There's no crime in asking for help. We all do it. And good troubleshooters are very, e very eager to go get help because their goal is to solve it. They're not worried about the emotion or pride or what someone is going to think if they ask a dumb question. The old statement, there is no dumb question. The only dumb question is the one that didn't get asked. That's the dumb question. I was at a training thing one time where a person says, I have a really dumb question. They asked the question, everybody in the room laughed, except for one problem. They asked the question, the most important question of the day. Their question seemed stupid, but it was at the core of the problem. No one thought to ask it. If you have an intermittent problem, what do you do? Well, one of the things you can do is ignore it. How bad is it? How often does it occur? This is actually a valid response to an intermittent problem. If it's something that happens like once a month, and your quick analysis shows that it's going to be really, really hard to find. It doesn't cost anything. It's a nuisance. Uh, how much effort are you going to spend on it? Not much. Routine maintenance. This is another thing that's done. For example, edit and resave a component. It may not fix it. But it's certainly not going to hurt anything. Uh, exit the program and reopen. Have you ever run into that where you exit and you come back and the problem's gone? Never recur again? That happens. We've actually said to people, why don't you reboot the computer and retry it? last we hear of it. Change the conditions. If you have an intermittent problem, change the operating conditions. Change something. Try to force the problem to occur. Keep a history. If it's intermittent, that means there is some kind of a history. There's some repeatability in it, unless it's a singleton event. But keep a history. That may help you find it. You may determine in your history certain events occurred right before this problem every single time. We have found problems that way. Of course, you can always do this. The old control alt delete and shut it off. Why does troubleshooting fail? It does fail. And the main one is this. People push the panic button. How many people in here have heard of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? What's on the cover of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Don't panic. This is the thing that usually gets people in trouble. They get partway through the process. They panic. They bail out. And I've actually had a person call me one time. They were just totally distressed. And they're going through this whole scenario, and I realized they were one step from the solution, but they panicked. Had they gone a little bit further, they would have found the problem. And so we're going to have a little problem here. This thing keeps wanting to go to the end. Okay. What do you do when pro troubleshooting fails? Talk, using the wrong tools. Sometimes we have the wrong tool that we're working with uh, for analysis tools, wrong analysis technique. We're using a linear method. And of course, the errors in line 3,212 of 3,213 lines, which obviously is going to be a problem. Using flowcharts and troubleshooting trees. We don't have enough data. I mentioned that one. Sometimes you just need more data. Or it's beyond the knowledge base of the user, and that happens to all of us. You know, we're going as far as we can go. We just don't know how much further to go. Someone who's more familiar with the system can look at it and say, well, you've got to do this or do that to get more information. No plan. Hoping to get lucky. Does getting lucky ever work? <laughs> yeah, sometimes. But don't trust that. That's not the solution. When it fails, the first thing you want to do is evaluate your problem statement. Did you properly put a fence around that problem? Or are you looking in the wrong direction entirely? Recheck your steps. Verify your conditions. And be willing to start over. 
Most troubleshooters have no problem starting over from the beginning because their assumption is if they didn't find it, maybe they got, didn't get, follow a proper process. They got lost along the way. So a good troubleshooter has no problem going over from the beginning again. When troubleshooting fails, try other tests. Maybe you didn't get enough data. Try another method. You know, if you used a halving method and you couldn't find it like I did with that data that time, I went back to a bit of a linear method for a while, started stumbling through until I realized there was some bad data. Expand your knowledge base. If you've got a JavaScript error, learn something about JavaScript. And get help. You know, if all else fails, ask. I mean, we're a, guy, we're a lot of, I shouldn't say there's some ladies in here, obviously, but most of us are guys in here. And what's the first thing a guy does when he gets lost? He'll never ask directions. Ask directions. We're going to talk about tools in Alpha Anywhere. And the first thing to understand is a troubleshooting tool only gives you information. That's all it does. <coughs> it does not interpret the information. It just gives you information. Don't assume the tool is going to tell you the problem, although we have some that kind of do tell you the problem. We're looking at server-side tools. We're going to look at client-side, some for the application server, particularly when we're looking at performance. Uh, some special tools. We're going to show you one in here, which is kind of useful when you're doing performance analysis, and some general tools. So let's get started here. We're going to do a few examples. We have some time here. <coughs> we're going to show you some ways in which you can apply different tools and different techniques. We're going to try to show a couple different techniques using the data we have. So first we're going to take a look at something, and luckily for this particular presentation, a lot of the stuff you're going to see here, you've seen already this week. Uh, some of it we've covered in the Tuesday class, for those of you who are in it. You've also seen other people present it as well. So uh, one of the things we're looking at is what's called the debugger. And we also have syntax checkers and a few things like that. Here we have a script. And up here at the top we have a thing here which is called check syntax. And if we click that, we find out this particular script has an error. It even tells us where it is, so it's pretty nice. But there's also something else that says where it is. If you notice something new in the new systems here, we have this little red squiggly line. Uh, there's other uh, syntax checkers that do the same thing. If we click on it, it tells us what line the error is on. And then when we click on it, it tells us what's wrong. A missing right parentheses. And if we look at this, now we can look at a pattern recognition, and sure enough, the pattern looks wrong. We need a closing parenthesis. We put that in and we run it. Now, if we look at what this script is doing, do a little explanation here. It's going out. It's opening a connection. It's getting an employee ID from uh, the employee's table. And then it's going down and trying to find orders for that employee. At the very end, we're going to employ another troubleshooting tool, a way of showing the result. This is one called show var. It takes a variable and it shows it in a nice little window so you can see what data is coming back. It's really good for lists of data. We'll show you another one in a minute. So if all this works, what should we see when we run this? We should see a list of data. And we go to run it and, whoops, we got an error. Now, what we've done here is we have the system set up in the system settings to open the debugger on every error. So the debugger fires up and also tells us what error it found. I'm sure some of you have seen this particular error. It says result set requested not found. We're looking for a column. If we look down here at where this hit, I'll just put this right underneath, what do we have here? I did an execute and came back and I assumed I got data back. Bad assumption. So I came back and I didn't get any data, so when I did the result set dot data, I got an error because there is no result set. It's empty. So there's times when you'll get an error where the error is in one place, but the cause of it is, this is not the cause. This generated the error message, but it's not the cause of our problem. What is the cause of our problem? Anybody notice anything? Lundoon. Yeah, Lundoon. I don't know who lives in Lundoon, but obviously nobody that we know. So we'll just close the debugger here, and we'll come in and we'll go fix up Lundoon, <clears throat> make it Lundun. And now when we run it, everything should work, right? We should find an employee, we should find orders, everything should be great. And we run it, and what do we get? This is the show var window. We got nothing. <clears throat> so now why do we get nothing? Well, a lot of techniques we can use. The first one we're going to look at is a halving type technique. We already have some information from our first test, right? We know we got down to here to line 12. We know we got that far because that's where we got the error. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume everything worked. We're going to take, make an assumption, and we're going to check the assumption. 
We're going to assume that we got an employee and we got to assume that we went to get orders. So I'm going to come down here where the order list should be emitted and I'm going to put a debug. Now debug will cause the debugger to open at that point. So anytime I hit a debug statement, the debugger should pop open. So now when I run it, I should put, debugger should open at this point, and when I run it, I get a blank screen. What did I learn? I learned I never hit that spot. I ran a having technique, and I just eliminated a piece because it never got there. So now what I can do is I can back up, and I'll take this one out, and I'll go a little further back. I'll expand my block a little bit. I'm still doing a block technique. Incidentally, I could have put a debug at the very top and walk through this line by line, but it gets a little tedious. So instead, I'm going to throw this in here. And now when I open it, I got the execute, and there's a thing called uh, call result. When you open a SQL connection, we have a thing called call result text. And so we'll step into it, and we get a piece of information. An argument value is referenced, but no argument list was provided. We look up here, yes, we have an argument. We set where order employee ID equals this. We actually set the argument up here, but now we're going back to a pattern recognition. Actually, uh, we'll show you where you can actually get some more information. So we know the errors at that CN execute. Actually, if we were to put this underneath, what do we see? The execute says statements, then arguments. Oops, we forgot arguments. So we'll just, of course, take this out. Now we're going to add arguments. And we run it. Now, which, should it work? Should work. Let's see what we get. We get down here, we get the debug. We'll step through it. We don't get any error. Everything looks fine. We run it and uh, close the debugger. And we have data. Great. We've got it fixed. But do we really? Now, if we understand the system and we've got all the data, we already may know there's more than one employee in London. Or London. Um, it may not be Stephen Buchanan we're looking for. We may have made a logical error. Now, a lot of these tools will not give you a logical error, but they can be used that way. What we can do is go up here and say, select the employee from where, where employees are from London. We may have more than one. So we put in our SQL Query Builder, really nice tool. We can check our query, see what it brings. We have the query down here, and we run it. And what do we find? We find there's a number of employees in London, not just the one we found. So we have a logical error. So in that case, we're going to have to put a better filter on here to see what comes next. So we have a little bit of a problem there. Let's look at another script that we have, O2 here. <clears throat> Here's an interesting one. We're basically going to do just the top piece of this whole thing. In other words, this is another technique you can do when you're working in this, when you're doing a having type technique, is just run part of the script. What I could have done in this one is go down in the script one, I could have done the same thing and just said, okay, I'm just going to comment all of this out. And this is another thing you can do. You can just comment a whole block of code and see what happens in the other block of code. You know, if the error is in this block of code and I comment it out, the error goes away. So we're going to do that up here. We're going to run it. Let's see what happens. Notice down here I have a different way of showing the result. I'm using a message box. We're working on a desktop, so the UI message box is an appropriate solution. So we're going to show what employee we find. So if we run this, we should see an employee number come up. It should be the wrong one, but something should come up. And we don't get any employee. Is there a problem in our code? It ran. Didn't throw any obvious errors. Well, here's a case where a linear analysis might make some sense. So we'll put a debug up here at the top, and let's see what happens. So we're running down through here. We're going to open the connection. And uh, whoops, we had an error, but we had trapped the error because we did an if. And if we look at this error, has anyone ever seen this error? <laughs> if you're working with SQL, you've probably seen this a number of times. Does the error give you much information? Well, the only piece of information on here that's really useful is invalid syntax. That means there's a problem with my connection. Uh, this other stuff down here is kind of interesting information, but doesn't tell us a great deal. So if we have an invalid connection, did we ever even open the connection? The answer was no. So this middle section here with the execute and so on, it never even ran. Therefore, we never got a result. So let's go take a look at something here. If we look at our documentation for the, uh, I can get this to come up, there we go. SQL connection open, it shows how we can open a connection with a full connection string 
as we see here, or as a named connection. If we look at the named connection, notice what we have. Colon, colon, name, colon, colon, the name of the connection. We go look at our code, and what do we have? A single colon. This we're using a, a linear analysis method to find where the error occurred. And now we're going to use a pattern type thing. We know this is the wrong pattern. The pattern says it should have two colons. We only have one. So if we put the second colon in, this should run. And we're going to be optimistic. We're going to take out our debug because we say it's going to work. I'm confident, but I am going to test it. And I test it, and I'm sure enough, I found an employee. So you can see we can use different tools, different techniques. And it, both these examples, we've used multiple techniques. We've used a linear, we've used a block, we've used patterns. And a good troubleshooter is going to use whatever works. I'm not going to lock yourself into one. Now we said earlier when we did the select employee, if we had an error there and we hit the uh, result set, uh, it threw an error. Well, here's another way you can do this and see, check it out. It's something called next row for those of you who are working a lot in SQL. When we get a result set back, and we covered this earlier on Tuesday, when a result set comes back, there's no focus on any row. The cursor is not on any row yet. So the very, if we put a, a next row command in, it'll put the cursor on the very first result set row. Of course, if there is no result set, is there a first row? No. So if result set next row would come back false if there's no data at all. If it comes back true, we have data. So when it comes back true, we can say, OK, now I can go get data. So in this case, we're going to assume there may be an error. We're going to try to trap it. Very often when we get a bug, it's a self-induced bug because we did not assume a problem could occur. Do problems occur in our code? How many people have had a problem in their code? <laughs> you get your arms tired going up and down. And notice what we did here. We also did it using these message boxes again. If we didn't find a user, an employer, employee came back not found. And if we did find one, it came back with the, the proper one. So for instance, if I did this single colon here in this one, what would I get? I don't get an error, but it does tell me the employee was not found because it never ran the execute. So we're showing how, here we're showing the use of debug and XBasic, the server side. We can do the same thing to a limited extent in components. So we'll take a look at, uh, let's see, yeah, we'll look at a UX component. Here we have an on dialog initialize and we have a debug stuck in here and we want to do something similar. We're going to set an employee as n and we're going to set an argument. So we can run a debug and see what's going to happen. Now in this case, Depending on where we put the debug, we're either going to be doing a linear, the whole darn thing, or we're going to look at a single piece. Now, the debug will work in working preview. If we run it here, we, sure enough, we hit the debug, and we can run it. Uh, and then when it opened up, did anybody see a problem here? Uh, we got data over here in a list, but we didn't get any data over here. We're going to take a look at that in a minute. The debug will also work in live preview when you're running in the builder because it's running in the same context. So we run it in live preview, and sure enough, we hit the debug again, and away we go, and it runs. And uh, whoops, now we're running in live preview, now we're seeing more errors, aren't we? We're seeing all kinds of funny errors. We're seeing a JavaScript error. Is this, is this error at all helpful to us? Uh, the only thing it helps us with is it tells us there's an error. It doesn't give us anything else. And we keep going, and you can see we're starting to get a whole bunch of errors. And uh, if you notice something when this ran, try this again. There's another piece of information that's actually useful. Let me get rid of the debug here. I'm going to get rid of that in a second. What looks wrong? Anybody notice anything here? Where are my buttons? I got an error, but no buttons came up. This is an important piece of information. We'll talk about why. And there the buttons popped up, but we still got an error, and we still keep going. Why that's important, it tells us a rough idea of where in the code the error occurred in the sequence of actions, because the error popped before the buttons came up. Can you use the nah, not really. Not in JavaScript. This is a JavaScript error. It's very different. So anyway, the other thing that comes up, if we run this in a browser outside of this, the debug will not work because of the context. The debugger won't open up when we run over here. It just goes up. 
Uh, also notice in this particular case, we didn't see any JavaScript errors. We're running in Firebug, which handled, or Firefox with Firebug, so it handled it a little differently. So let's go back and look at this. Get rid of our debug here. And notice when we ran it, we had some JavaScript errors. So first point here is if we have XBasic on the server, server side events, we can use debug and working preview and live preview in the builder. That helps us. We go to the server, we cannot. We'll show you some ways around that. But we also had some JavaScript errors. And the first thing we'll do here is when we go to save this, uh, we got an error. In the newer builds, we have a JavaScript syntax checker, which is turned on on this machine. Uh, some people have to turn it off because of conflicts, but for the most part, it comes up. And it gives me some information. It said it couldn't parse the JavaScript from a, from a script. Uh, and it gave where it was. It says error line 2, column 67. And it shows where the error is, a little error thing here. It's kind of neat. So we go look at our JavaScript. It could be a lot of places. It could be a client-side event. It could be in functions. We'll check functions. Uh, and now we're going to look at it for a pattern. We had the syntax checker. It shows us there's a problem. It says line two, line two. And actually, we carried over, counted over 67 characters. We'd find out we're missing an ending quote. So I'll put a single quote in. And notice it was in red, which gave us an indication of roughly where the problem was. So we're giving you some tools to help you lead you to the problem. But you still have to recognize it's bad JavaScript. Now it should work, right? Let's go around and try it. Oops, still got a problem. Now, again, if you look at this, what's you know, kind of a, kind of like a little misspelling here, maybe. But again, does this tell us much about it? The answer is not a great deal. We could run in working preview. Uh, this has the Chrome debugger on it. If I can get it to scroll down here to the bottom, probably doesn't want to do. There we go. I'm running in Chrome, so I could open the Chrome debugger and rerun the page. And we'll look at uh, if I can get the Chrome debugger to pop up. It says alert is not defined. Didn't give us anything more than, than IE did, but gives us some information. So we know there's a problem here. So we can go look at that. Also notice we're still not getting data. Why are we not getting data? The reason we're not getting data is when we hit a JavaScript error that's, that's loading the component, one of the last things the component does is load data. Well, the JavaScript failed before it got to that point in the data. That's a pattern that you would know if you're looking at the source code. You could actually look at the source code and say, well, if it fails here, it never runs any further. So the data was there. It just never got loaded onto the form. Yeah. The web control panel has a search capability. Yep. Oh, hi. The, the web project's control panel has a, has a tremendous search capability. Yep. Um, so I have a two-part question. We saw the message that says A-L-E-T-R is not defined. Yep. Okay, so we know we've misspelled alert. Yep. So my first question is, in the web projects control panel, if we put that A-L-E-T-R, would, would, it, would it find the component that has it? We know it's this component, but my question is, would it find that component? It would find the component, but it wouldn't tell you where it is in the component. Okay, and so my second question is, would it, is, it, is there a search capability in each component, and how difficult there would is, that be if anybody could do that? There is in the controls, but a lot of this stuff, we'll show you a minute, where you can get a better error message, which will take you right to the source. The, the tools are there. I'm just showing, in fact, I'm actually showing the wrong way to do it. I'm showing you using the wrong tool and why it made it hard. So we look in here and we think, okay, we've looked into JavaScript functions. We know what's thought in there. Where else has, must it be? Probably in an event. In fact, here we have a client-side event, and you can see we uh, kind of goofed up here, and we misspelled alert. Now, one of the things I want to point out here, here is another place you can use a type of having technique. You may not know what sequence these client-side events run. Just put an alert in the ones you want to check with some extra text so you know what order they come in. So as they pop up on screen, you can see what order the events ran in. This was a technique that goes back to the old days of desktop. We had desktop events, and we didn't know what was going on. We put a message box on each event and see how the message, message boxes would pop up. Same thing you can do on, on this. I don't really want to fix this. I'm just going to comment it out. So I'll just comment it out. If I can get it to comment out. There we go. So if I made the assumption with the pattern because I had a JavaScript error, the data never loaded because it never got that far, what should I see now when I run it? 
what I should see is a properly behaving component with data. And sure enough, that's what I got. We're going to take a look at another uh, UX. And this, from, this is actually from our uh, Tuesday class. And it somehow disappeared, so we'll just run it right out of here. Here's one we did, and we're going to run it in fire. We're going to run it in uh, live preview first. And, okay, you should pick it up in a second here. There we go. It's got syntax error. That's real helpful. No, we got another error. We get another error. We get another error. And if we wait around, we'll get some more errors. We're getting a whole bunch of errors. This thing's got major problems, right? But did we learn anything from the IE debugger? Not much of all. So let's run it in Firefox and Firebug. Firebug is a great little tool. Notice that it did come up, but if we turn on Firebug and we refresh this, what are we going to find? Notice we get a whole bunch of errors here. Remember what I said earlier, if you have a JavaScript error, it may stop propagating the code. So here we have the very first one, and it really shows us where it is exactly. We have a, a message box show, and we have double quote or double commas here. That's a pattern that's wrong. Again, that's a pattern recognition. Because this failed, all these other ones occurred because of the first one. Again, that's a pattern understanding how the code is, lays out on the page. If this fails, this is going to fail, this is going to fail, and this is going to fail. If we didn't understand that basic pattern, we'd be looking at the last error first. We want to look at the first error. So if we go up and fix this, that should fix all the errors. Because of time, I won't go in and do that. Another thing we can do while we're working on the, the uh, in, on uh, browser, when we're working in a browser, it's hard, you can't run debuggers very well because you can't see what's going on. Well, here's another trick you can do. Here we can do, we have a, a server-side event. We can do this on server-side events. Um, we can put in a save the file, for example. Here I have a data submitted coming in when I submit this. I can save that data to a file, or I can use save to file or file from string. It's basically the same thing. So I can see what the data is, and I can use that comment, save it to a text file, and show it. Now, if this particular event had uh, a JavaScript capability, like e.javascript, I could send that value out in an alert box as well. So now I can see it on the, on the, on the uh, uh, browser. Now, of course, if you're doing these things, remember to remove them when you're done. I do this all the time, and inevitably, I'll look at a, an application that's up and running. I'll see a bunch of little text files like, oops, <laughs> forgot to comment that one out. So but this is one way you can find out where data is at certain points. So when you're working in this environment, which is kind of isolated, you really are stuck using a having type technique because you don't want to fire out all the values, typically. <coughs> so we could run this and see what's in there, but we'll just kind of skip over that. So if we're think, talking about the app server and we're working on debugging there, we can, on the server side, we can use some debugs. We can do a save to file. We can use alert boxes to show values at certain points. But there's some other things we have available to us. When we're working on the application server, we have log files we can use. And we're going to bring up some log files. We basically have three log files. We have an error log, uh, error stack log, and I got five minutes, so we'll keep going here. So one of the first ones we're going to look at is what's called the access log. This tells us what the access is coming in. Normally, we don't turn these on. The only one that should be turned on is the XBasic error stack log because it should be relatively empty. I deliberately made some errors in here so we could see what it looks like. Uh, a lot of this information may not be terribly useful to you, but if you're going through here and you see a thing called uh, you know, session variable not found, you may want to think, oops, did I forget to set that session variable? Happens a lot. Look at the access log. What's useful about this is this is the IP address of who's coming in here. Do you see an IP address that makes no sense? So nobody would know. Or you see a request for a PHP page? Uh, somebody's trying to break into your system. So it's nice to know that. So this can be a very useful one. The error log. We get requests, comments about this like all the time. What's this? Are these, are these errors? No, it's telling you what the server's doing. It says it had too many spare threads, so it dropped some threads off. Well, then it didn't have enough spare threads, so it created new threads. This is normal. This is actually quite good. If you see a lot of this in your, your error log, that's a very good thing because we're cleaning memory and we're using memory, then cleaning it up, using it, cleaning it up, using it, and cleaning it up. So it's actually a very good thing. 
talk a little bit about an analysis tool. We talk about when we're doing performance ch testing, uh, we need information. And it's hard to get information. Here's one that's quite useful. That it's documented, but not many people seem to know about it. A function called Analyze Web Access Logs. If you have access logs, this function is going to give you information about them. If you run it here on the desktop, we can go out and we can pull up an access log. And we can chart it or we can list it. We'll just show the chart. And we can see a chart of the loads on the server. Now, these are requests per minute. So you can see when the server was very active. You can also see when it was basically asleep. It's very useful. You can see how much load your server has. If you're having a performance problem, what is the load on my server? I have seen charts with this as high as 300 requests a minute. This one's out of the rather lightly loaded. And you can save this chart to a file as an image. I can check another one here. Uh, I think this one's a little, got a little bit more. One of these has a rather strange behavior. You can see all over here it was quiet, and all of a sudden in one minute it had 100 requests. Actually, I can look at the actual log. I see 100 requests in one minute. In that case, I want to go look at that log. What the heck was going on at 4 a.m. in the morning that we got 100 requests in one minute? Uh, that one actually turned out to be someone trying to hack into the system. There's PHP pages and a few other things, so it's very helpful. What people don't know is you can run this on the web as well. And let me see if I can get to the uh, web control panel. We have a web page here. It's a very complex web page. Put an A5 code section, put the function in there, and put a question mark in front of it. That's all you need. And what do you get when you actually run it? You get this. Oops, let me get this out of the way. We don't need the debugger here. Page that comes up and looks something like this. It shows all the uh, access logs for this particular server that's running. So I can pick an access log off of this particular server, and I can show the data, and it shows the exact same thing on screen that we had before. So we can actually do it in a web page. As you can see, it's very complex code, <laughs> one line. And you can do it on a web page. There's other things you can look at. Uh, I'll show you one other here. If you're running under Always Up, Always Up will give you some information about what your system's doing, uh, which is useful. And there's one more that I'm going to make Dave stand there and wait on and have him moan. Firebug, very useful product, and here's why. A lot of times we don't know why we have a performance problem. Let's compare two grids here. Here we have a, a grid with a detail view, and down here it tells us how long it took to run. As you can see, the first time we load it, it took 2.28 seconds. We sort a row, you can see it's going to be quite a bit faster. Actually, it's kind of slow right now because this machine's kind of overloaded, it's trying to do a lot. So in here, we can see 780 milliseconds. Let's go down to a slightly different one here. Yeah, it's going down to here. Here we have an editable grid. Uh, if you watch here, it's going to take a little while. That's because all the fields are editable in this tabular grid. 5.77 seconds. Is that going to be acceptable to your end users? Mm, no, I don't think so. Even if I do a sort, it's going to take a while. 4.3. And if you really want to annoy your users, bring up 100 records or so. Now, let's see here. Let's just change this to, uh, yeah, 75. Yeah, it should, uh, let's see if it even runs. It's going to take like 15 seconds. So when you've got a performance issue, there's tools out there to help you figure this out. Well, it didn't even actually do it to 50 rows. Still doing 10. If I can get it to go to 75. There we go. Now it's going to go. It's going to take a little while. The point here in troubleshooting is there's tools out there. The tools give you information, but it's up to you to analyze them. It's up to you to determine how to use that tool the most effectively. And as you can see, this thing's still looking for that data. And I'm sure by then your customers on the phone say it's things broke. But after 14 seconds, we got data. This is a design error. You got what way too much data on this page. It's all editable fields, lookups, drop downs. There's some pretty big drop downs on here. Bad idea. So we're kind of out of time, and uh, I guess somebody's next. Yeah, if uh, anyone would like to ask questions of Jerry while we set up uh, Lee for the next session. Yes, Kevin? It would be really helpful, and I'm, I'm new and I'm probably missing something, but it would be really helpful in the, when we get those error messages if it could tell us explicitly what method that error occurred in, I see like a template type thing, and I just don't know exactly what that is. Maybe I'm it's missing al something. It's almost impossible because a lot of the, the errors occur way after the cause. And 
you know, some of the errors, we try to put errors in there that are descriptive, but there are situations where the error is being generated, for instance, like uh, an ODBC driver, and we have no control over what error comes back, or it's coming from the SQL database. Uh, yeah, just like that. So, you know, we may not have full control over what the error is. You know, we try to make them very descriptive, but uh, a lot of times we can't. And again, the error message doesn't tell you the solution. It just tells you there's an error and gives you a piece of data. Well, you know, if you designed it, you should, should look kind of similar. And that's the point of the troubleshooting tools, is go through different processes until you can find it. Troubleshooting is not going to pop up a little message and say, go to line 53, slot number 2, and change that comma, and take that extra comma out. No error message is going to tell you that. Yes? <laughs> Jerry, uh, yeah, a technique, technique I use quite a bit is uh, in the Windows kernel, there is a, uh, an API called output debug string. Yeah, I was going to get there, but we never ran out of time. So. Okay, so that is something you There's can There's a still... lot of tools out there outside of Alpha that can help you as well. Windows Event Log, for example. And there's a variety of other things. I mean, these are just tools. I didn't want to spend too much time on tools because a lot of these have already been covered. But the key is tools just give you data. They don't tell you anything about where it is. That's up to you. We'll get that with that later. Yeah, yeah, that's that's in the system. That's standard. You can start typing in A5W underscore analyze, it'll pop right up. Yeah, but that was a part of the presentation, but because of time limitations, there was a couple of things I wanted to show that I couldn't. Uh, but again, you know, the little details like that are less important than the process you're using. If you're using a good process, you go step by step, you realize the data is just data, it's not an answer, and you start, you know, you get an error message, it's not going to tell you what, what caused the error, it might give you a little information. It's just information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry.